Okay. Um, so, the, are there any questions from last time? This is, should be a review of actually some basic math. We'll get into a few new things today, um, specifically the impulse function, which I, I, I should have seen in, in circuits too. Uh, we will see it a lot and in this course. Um, we're going to be working a lot with different waveforms. So we want some notation, some mathematical notation to represent the types of waveforms we run into a lot in electrical systems. And you know, You've seen I think these before in your in your service class. The, the first one is that we'll look at is it's called the unit step. And it's sometimes called the, the switching function. But you know, for example. We could use this notation like that to represent turning on a 12 volt supply at t equal zero and leaving it on. Okay. It's it's one in a class of what, what's called singularity functions that is either not finite or has a, a non-finite derivative. So in like math, in your calculus class, I think. Let's say this thing is it has a, a zero derivative everywhere except at t equal to zero, where the derivative would be undefined or perhaps infinite. We're actually going to define the derivative of this function. It turns out to be useful to us mathematically. The derivative is actually the impulse function. Um, we're going to we'll be doing several projects in Octave or MATLAB and. I'll do a little exercise later in class, but you can define functions in MATLAB. You can define them in a file or in your function file. You can use the standard define function uh, notation, but it also has anonymous functions. For those of you who are in computer engineering, may have run into those. Um, and you can define a, a especially simple functions like this. Just using that notation, we define the function mu of t in, in MATLAB. Now, I'll, I'll do some plots here. We'll do some examples at the, for the end of class where we'll play around with some of these functions, and I'll show you how, to, how easy that is to do in, in MATLAB. So, what we'll really be using these functions, though, these simple functions, are um, is to compose more complex functions. Now, let me uh, I'll give the answer away. So let's this goes from two to five. So it has a height of four. X of t. Now that's certainly not a unit step. But we can represent it as a sum of or difference of time shifted unit step functions. And so, for example, I have to write this as four times u of t minus two. Now, can you visualize what this part looks like? It would have a height of four right, instead of a height of one. And it will be shifted to the right by two units. So it would be this, and then would continue to be four forever. So what do I need to do to get x of t? Subtract what? Four u of t minus five would do it, right? So I can represent that pulse as a, in this case, a difference of two time-shifted unit steps. And 
that, that will certainly be important to us later on because as we start working with transforms, you know, um, it, uh, we could, the, the Fourier transform, the Laplace transform of X of T would be the difference of these simple Laplace transforms. Yes. Um, we can compose more complex functions out of, out of simple functions. Unit ramp is not used nearly as often as the unit step. Doesn't occur. Let me just go ahead and define it. But this is a unit ramp. And at one, it has a height of one. At two, it has a height of two. It actually has, for t greater than zero, I can take the derivative of that, the derivative is one. So it has a slope of one for t greater than zero. But if I multiply it by 10, it would have a slope of 10. Um, in octave MATLAB, we can generate this function as t dot times u of t. And this is one of the other purposes of that unit step. It's, it's a switching function to turn some other function on or off or, or to zero it out for all t less than t less than zero. So I'll give you a few seconds to so we've got this two four. Let's say it has a height of eight. <clears throat> Express x of t as a sum or difference of Amplitude scaled and time shifted ramps and or steps, unit step functions. Okay, well, at least this, usually it's easiest to start on, start on the left and work your way to the right. And we see that this, this first part is a shifted ramp that starts at t equal two. It doesn't have a slope of one though. What is the slope? Slope is four there, right? Has a rise of eight over two seconds. So this, that first part would be a four R of T minus two. That's a, and that would continue on like this. So something has to be kick in or we want to subtract something at T equal to four so that this thing doesn't continue to rise. So what do you suggest? Unit step, we're going to have to get there eventually, but let's take care of the slope first. If, if I subtract, I could subtract eight, an eight unit step, 
that would actually just drop it here and then it would continue like that. Okay. So. Well, what we could do is, or this is the way, I'm saying this is necessarily best, but just subtracting. So this function would be like this, right? You see that the difference here is constant. So now when I subtract this one from that one, well, is this the final answer? No, because that subtraction would do this. Okay. We just level off there. Now is where, again, you could have subtracted the unit step first if you wanted to do that, drop it down here, then subtract the ramp. That, that's perfectly fine. But what do I need to, is this right? U of t minus four? Why is that not right? Because it's not one. Because it's not one, what is it? Eight, this has a height of eight, right? So I need to actually subtract eight U of t minus four. Okay. Um, you know, the, the goal here, is to express it as a sum or difference of simpler functions. Sometimes you can express these as a product of simpler functions, but we almost never want to do that. For example, u of minus t is going to be, you know, one for all negative time. A shifted time reverse function, you know, I can shift this thing so it actually is, is zero for t greater than five. Multiply that by this and still get this function as a product. We don't want to do that because we're going to be working with Fourier transforms or plus transforms, which are linear, which have this property that the transform of a sum is the sum of the transforms. Unfortunately, the transform of a product is not the product of the transform. Okay, so that's, we want to stay away from, it actually becomes convolution, okay. So we want to try and write these more complex functions as a sum of, of simpler functions. So, so that's the goal. Um, the, the ramp is actually related to the unit step. Now, this is, I'll often call this the integral of a function. This, this will be the output of a, of a circuit that we call an integrator. And it's the upper limit here that's a function of time. And so, you know, where does that come about? If you think about integrating this, you know, um, out to t, you know, for t less than zero, the integral of u of t is zero. For t greater than zero, you know, if I integrate now from minus infinity out to say t equal one, I'll get one times one. If I integrate out to t equal to two, I'll get one times two or two. If I integrate out to t equal three, I'll get three. So for t greater than zero, that integral is equal to t. For t less than zero, I get zero. Well, that's the definition of my unit ramp. So I'll often, we'll often call this integration, where the upper limit is sometimes it's called a running integral, where the upper limit actually varies with time. This is a function of time through the, the variation in that upper limit on, on the integral. So it's a, it's a little bit different than maybe the integral you run into in, in calculus. And it is also true that the unit step is equal to the derivative of the ramp. For t less than zero, it's equal to zero. For t greater than zero, the derivative of t is one. Um, another type of signal we'll be working with a lot is, is 
pulses, pulses of voltage or pulses of current. So we, we use a, a function, it's the rectangular function or the rect function, R-E-C-T. It's defined as zero or T great, absolute value of T greater than one half. It's equal to one when the absolute value of T is less than one half. It looks like this. Minus one half, one half has a height of one. This is rect of T. The width is one. But through amplitude scaling and time scaling, compression or expansion, we can get pulses of any width and any height. This is rect of T, sorry. You can verify that A rect of T over capital T, for example, was, that's amplitude scaling multiplying by A. And this is actually expansion by T. So instead of having a width of one, rect of T over capital T would have a width of T, capital T. Which means it's non-zero between minus T over two and T over two. So the way I always remember that is the width of the pulse here goes in the denominator. It's T over the width of the pulse. Um, we could also express rect of T as U of T plus a half. That would be a unit step shifted to the left by half minus U of T minus a half. So this rec notation is really just convenient. We could express, express recs in terms of unit steps, but you know, we work with these pulses often enough, it's, it's nice to have this shorthand notation. So write an expression for x of t. Sorry, get below the monitors there, I guess. So write an expression for x of t in terms of our rect function. Amplitude scaling, time shifting, time compression expansion, time scaling. Well, the amplitude part is easy, right? The rect part is, is a little tricky. What's the width? That part's not too bad. What's the width of that pulse? Just two. And then it's shifted from the center being at zero, the center is now three. So it's shifted to the right by three. And you might want to plug in different values of, of t to, to see that that's correct. With, with t equal to four, for example, four minus three is one. We've got rect of one half, which is this edge, this trailing edge. So that edge maps to t equal four here. And similarly, you can see that the t equal minus one half in our fundament, our basic rect function maps into x of two. Okay, so I want to play around with that to verify that that's the correct expression. Okay. 
is uh, the other temptation is to write it's rec t over two minus three instead of t minus three over two. But t over two minus three is not correct. It would be t over two minus three halves. That would be correct. Um, It's convenient to have notation for periodic waveforms. So let's say we've got this two, two, four, six, zero, eight. Minus two, and this thing continues throughout. It's a periodic function. What's the period of this function? So, what? The period is, you know, when it repeats. So, when do you see this leading edge again? How many seconds later? Four. When do you see this trailing edge again? How many seconds later? Four. So the, the you were giving me the duration, and that's it's easy to it's easy to confuse, confuse the duration of the pulse with the period. The duration is two. You'd say it actually has in this case a fifty percent duty cycle, but we can we can start with the what we call the the base function, which is two rect of t minus 1 over 2. This pulse is just x1 of t. That pulse just by itself would be x1 of t. Okay. We can represent the whole waveform. I could then get this one as a shifted version of x1 of t. Right? It would be x1 of t shifted by 4 seconds. This one would be x1 of t shifted by 8 seconds, the next one by 12, multiples of the period. Similarly, this one would be shifted to the right by 4 seconds. So I can express, express xt mathematically as a whole bunch, a sum of x1 of t functions all shifted by t where n goes from minus infinity to infinity. When n is equal to minus 1, that's when I get that one. When n is equal to minus 2, I get that one. You could write it as minus nt. That would be fine. It's, just, it's the same expression. Matter of fact, that, that's actually how I have it written in my notes, where t is equal to 4 in this case. It's, a, it's just a mathematical expression for writing a periodic function in terms of x1, which we call it the, the basis function of the periodic expression, of the periodic wave. Okay, any questions about that? All right, something a little more interesting is the impulse function often called the delta function, sometimes called the Dirac function, Paul Dirac, or the Dirac delta function. There's also an impulse function we'll, we'll deal, we'll talk about with discrete time systems um, and discrete time waveforms. These are all continuous time waveforms. So uh, the impulse function, it's actually, zero it's defined like this in terms of its properties so this is how we'll define it it's defined by two properties it's zero everywhere except at t equal to zero and then the other property it has is it has unit area 
So you, you can approximate it as, you know, really narrow pulse. Uh, let's say it has a height of A, so the width would be 1 over A, right? So that it has unit area. And then you approach an impulse as A becomes infinite. You have an infinitely tall pulse with zero width in that case. Okay, so you can, it's handy to think about an impulse. You know, we can't really generate this thing in the lab. It's, it's a mathematical construct. You can kind of, again, approximate it with a very short, high amplitude pulse. In mechanical systems, they, they um, um, to generate an impulse of force by striking a structure with a sledgehammer. Okay, that's, that's kind of a good model for mechanical systems. But it's, it's a short duration, high amplitude for mechanical systems, you know, applied force. For us, it would be like an applied voltage. Um, it's usually drawn. This function of time, so it's drawn as an up arrow, you know, at its location, in this case t equal to zero, and then there's a value shown next to it. That value is actually the area of the impulse. So it looks like the amplitude. You could call it the amplitude, and I will correct you. But you know, if I had ten delta t. And, and carried out the integral of 10 delta t, I could pull out the 10, and, and the area of 10 delta t would be 10. So whatever little number here is written next to it is actually the area of the impulse. So, so it's a strange thing. Turns out to be really useful in control systems and system analysis. We're actually going to define delta t as being the derivative of that unit step. And our unit step had a zero derivative, you know, for t less than zero, it's zero, certainly the derivative there is zero. For t greater than zero, our unit step is equal to one, again, the derivative is zero. It was, it's only at, you know, in your calculus classes, you probably would say that the derivative of the unit step is undefined at t equals zero. Well, we're actually defining it in first class. We're saying the derivative of the unit step is the Dirac delta function. It has some special properties, which we'll get into. And then, similarly, if you integrate this running integral, an impulse, you recover the unit step. Some, some other properties. Of the unit step. If you multiply, so this would be a shifted, I'm, I'm sorry, the impulse function, this would be a shifted impulse, right? Delta, delta, so here's how I write delta 10 delta t minus 2. I represent that graphically. That would be the shifted impulse with an area of 10 or a weight of 10. This is x of t delta t minus t. Okay. And what multiplying a shifted impulse by a time function, it changes the weight of the impulse by the value of the function at, at the location where the impulse is. Now, this is zero everywhere except the t equal to capital T because the impulse is that. So all this is doing is, is sampling that time function where the impulse is located. This is, this would now, you know, this is saying if I've got 
some function of t. This is what x of t looks like. And I multiply that by this thing. And I shift the delta impulse. What I get out, let's say this is this is actually, I'll say 12. What I get out for the product is this. An impulse whose weight is um, uh, the function value at the location of the impulse. So, and it's, it's zero everywhere else except where the impulse is located. So it's, it's a funny thing. So T delta T minus capital T T T. Now, <laughs> this is actually a consequence of the definition and the previous property. If I multiply, I know what the product of these two functions is, it's this. It's x of capital T, which is a constant, so I can pull it out of the integrand. So this just becomes x of capital T times the integral over an impulse. My integration limits here are from minus infinity to infinity, so it doesn't matter where the impulse is. I know that that integral is one. Okay, let's <clears throat> um, just just as an aside, let me am I integrating over the impulse there? Do the limits on my integration include uh, the location of the impulse? Yeah, the impulse is located at one, shifted from zero to one, and I'm integrating from minus two to two. So as long as my limits include, you know, if this were two delta t, it would be two. What's that equal to? My impulse is located at one. My limits of integration are from minus two to zero. And that interval, delta t minus one, is zero everywhere. So this, this is zero. Similarly, if I were integrating from three out to infinity, I would get zero with this thing located at one. I, I only get one for the area if my limits of integration include the location of my impulse. So this, this is the multiplication property of the impulse. This is what's called the, the sampling property. We'll talk about sampling later in the semester. Sampling is an important topic in modern electrical engineering as we move from analog signals to digital signals. Sampling microphone outputs, converting them to <coughs> digital formats like MP3, things like that. Or recording them on CDs. And the following property is that you know, compression or expansion of an impulse actually changes the weight of the impulse. This is this is the time scaling property. You can you can derive that using this integral prop, this integral property, and a, and a change of var uh, variables under the integral, okay. and that pops out. Okay. Um, I think you guys are familiar with exponential pulses. You know, th those are another basic. e to the minus t over tau, you know, it looks like this. It's equal to one at t equal to zero, and at t equal to tau, we have e to the minus tau over tau, or e to the minus one, that's 
is 0 0.037. That's what u to the minus t over tau looks like. Okay, it's just decreasing exponential. As I go to the left, for t negative, you know, this becomes infinitely large. So you know, here's the value of our unit step. I want just like an exponential pulse. I can multiply it by u t and kind of chop off the area to to the left to get you know, an exponential pulse. Okay. Um, briefly, let me define power and energy signals, and then we'll work. I think we've got some time to work through a few examples. Five. Power and energy. So, we define the power of a signal to be the signal squared. You're familiar with it, the voltage, um, the power in a resistor is the voltage squared divided by the resistance, or it's the current squared divided by the resistance. So we've kind of extended that concept and we talk about the power of any function. It's, it's the function squared, you know, across a one ohm resistance. Is this, if you want to think of it, it's the voltage across a one ohm, the power of a voltage across a one ohm resistance. Actually, to make it a little more general, this is fine for real functions. If x of t is a complex function, the power is defined to be the average the magnitude of the complex function squared. So this is what we call the instantaneous <coughs> power of a, of a function. How do you get energy from power? What's the relationship? You remember from physics? The power average. Yep, over time. Okay. So if you if you, mul you mul <laughs> multiply power by time, you get energy. Or power is the derivative of energy. Power is the time derivative of energy. We can get the energy within a certain interval t, capital T, by integrating from minus t over two. This is this is the energy within a certain uh, interval. So you know, the power company actually charges you for the amount of energy you use over the month. Right? Not, not power is an instantaneous quantity. They actually they, they charge you in kilowatt hours, which is watts, which is power times time. So they actually charge you for energy. So this is the energy in a certain interval of time t, or the average, or the total energy is the limit as, as t goes to infinity of, of t, or minus infinity to infinity p t of p t. So this is the total energy. The average power is you take the limit as t goes to infinity of one over of well it's really the energy divided by that time interval so this is the energy within that time interval divided by t and we pour back power but this is an app this is the average power it's the limit as t goes to infinity of e t over t. This is the average power. <coughs> For periodic signals, and this is an important one, the average power you can integrate over just a period of the waveform. If if the, if the function is periodic, the square of the function will be periodic, the power will also be periodic. 
if you just integrate over a period and divide by the period, you get the average power. You don't have to do this limiting operation out to infinity. Okay. Now, we can classify signals according as either power signals or energy signals. Most pulse type signals can be classified as energy signals. If you calculate the average power here of a pulse type signal, it will actually be zero. We can compute the, the average energy that's finite. If we take this limit where we divide by T, the average power goes to zero for pulse type signals. There are certain types of other signals, like periodic signals that are infinite, or sinusoids, which are also periodic signals, or even noise which actually have infinite energy, okay? Because they keep going on forever. When we square them, we get just a positive result. You know, if you integrate minus infinity, that, that interval blows up. So they have infinite energy, but they have finite power. So most periodic signals are classified as power signals. Most pulse type signals, so these have P equals zero, E is finite. These have E is infinite, power is finite. There are certain signals that actually have an infinite power like, in, like a, a periodic set of impulses, okay? But most real signals we work with are either power signals or, or energy signals. Okay, let's, um, we've got five minutes. Let's do a couple of examples. And, most of what I have you do in the homework is function composition. So So express right x of t as a sum of amplitude scaled and or time shifted unit steps. Someone want to tell me what you got? Yeah. 
here on my What do you get? We'll go home if we finish this problem. Three U, T minus <laughs> Three U of what? T minus two. T minus two? Minus three U, T minus four. Minus three U, T minus four? Plus six U, T minus four. Okay. Minus six U. My six what? My six U T minus six. Right. Everyone agree with that? Yeah, you can certainly combine these, right? As just plus three U of T minus four. Because here you're your three T of U minus two, and then now we're gonna add another three to jump up to six. And that's what you got, right? And so we can simplify that a little bit. You did it by this pulse and then adding that pulse. So give, give me just a second. And I'll show you how easy this is to, I said we, I'm not gonna define a, a function pi. I highly recommend that you actually put all this stuff into scripts, but I'll define that, that unit step function like this, okay. and then you know, t, I, I'll plot over the interval from zero to eight. I have to form a vector. So t, t going from zero to eight and increments of 0 0.01. So this t vector is gonna be about 800 elements long. Okay. And then now I just plot t, and then my function is three times u of t minus two, and then plus three u of t minus four, and then min minus six times u of t minus six, is that right? Or I could plot, you know, Amund's function with all four there. Okay. Can you see that? Does that match? It appears to, it, you know, it goes, it goes, let me drag it off here. Let me change the, the Y limit so you can see that Y limit actually going from zero to eight. That's that's our that's our pulse. Goes from two to six is three and then jumps up to six and back down. So it's just verifying our, our expression. It's really easy to do in just a couple of lines of MATLAB octave on your calculator. Have a good weekend. It's been a long semester. Hang in there. We're almost through it. You gotta be almost done. I know. I need to find a little bit more.